Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at today. My name is Scott Sandusky and I'm a product manager with the Insights team here in Redlands, California. Joining me today is Dr. Linda Beal. So hi, I'm Linda Beal. I'm the lead product engineer and I'm also based here in Redlands, California. In today's webinar, we're going to cover these three topics, exploratory analysis and how you can discover the unknown within your data statistical and spatial analysis so that you can take your analysis deeper and further and then sharing your results with interactive pages and analytical models for each of these topics we'll have a discussion then a software demonstration and then we'll have a question and answer section where we can hear from you but before we dive right into those three specifics I want to just get warmed up a tiny bit here step back and remind ourselves what is insights for ArcGIS well, in a few words, it's powerful analysis made simple. Insights gives you some of the most powerful analysis capabilities, but it makes them usable in a way that's visual, intuitive, and interactive. So, for example, analysis methods are presented to you in the form of questions, rather than requiring you to know what each specific tool actually does. Insights lets you select data and drag it into the page view, and then immediately options are presented to you. When you do this, Insights recognizes the type of data you're working with, either spatial, numeric, text, or date, and then it only presents to you those visualization options that make sense for that particular type of data. And those are just a few ways, and there's, there's more ways, in which Insights is smart about things, all to make things simpler and more easy for you. Insights is unique in that it brings together two worlds, the spatial world and the non-spatial world. So both tabular data sets like spreadsheets and database connections, those can be made. You know that database connection, it could be tabular or maybe there's an actual spatial field in there. Insights will recognize that spatial field. But also GIS content. Connect to that GIS data, bring it in, and work with it all together. And that's what's, again, special and unique about Insights. It treats both the spatial and non-spatial as first-class citizens and so that you can directly connect to that data in its current location. When you bring in non-spatial data, you can quickly and accurately spatially enable it. And key here is accuracy. Insights comes with location content. This is global boundaries, including boundaries that go down to some of the most granular boundary types. You can perform address level geocoding. And guess what? Even if you have custom spatial reference data, no problem. Insights handles that. And you can perform also spatial joins with points, lines, and polygons. All this to location enable your data. Insights is all about spatial analysis, or analysis in general. If we stop and think for a moment what analysis truly means, we might think about it like this. These three categories are buckets. Exploratory, spatial, and statistical. Exploratory analysis, that allows us to find the right questions to ask, uncover patterns and outliers, visualize the data so that trends can be seen and understood. Spatial analysis allows you to utilize that spatial dimension, right? And spatial is the unique thing that you, allows you to relate two data sets together simply by overlaying them. And statistical analysis so, so that you can quantify things like distribution, change, and patterns and describe it with meaningful numbers. What's great about insights is that these three things, categories, they all overlap and work together. They don't operate independently in silos but rather they support each other in workflows and to, they're, they're stronger together than individually. And we'll talk more about that later as well. So once you've completed some of that great analysis work, right, you've, you've uncovered information, you've found answers, what do you do then? Well, you want to get that great work into hands of people who can use it, of course. You want to share it. People who can benefit that and use that information you've uncovered. And Insights allows you to share that finished information products with other viewers and even share your analysis models with other analysts. All right, so enough of me talking here. Linda, would you mind showing us some examples of uh, what I've been 
Go on through. Absolutely. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start almost at the end of the story. So what we're going to do is work towards what you're seeing in front of you. So this is an analysis I've already done of fatal traffic accidents. What we're doing is we're viewing the page that I've shared out. So this allows us to see a number of different visualizations that I've put together and all of the interactivity between them. So let me click on something like uh, the number of vehicles that were actually rental vehicles. And if I click on that, you'll see all of the maps and charts are updating, giving us the information that's showing us where these accidents occurred, what the relationship was between the weather and the junctions on that road, the time of day and time of year when all of these accidents have happened. Remember, we're seeing aggregated numbers here and the age distribution of the people involved in those accidents. So as I say, this is the sort of final result of the analysis. And what we're going to be doing today, going through the demonstration, is actually showing how we can get to creating a page like this. So I'm going to switch back across to actually insights. I'm going to open a workbook. Let me just expand that page so we can see everything. And you'll see what we have now is pretty much the same as what you just saw. But now I'm actually inside my own workbook in insights. It looks like you're looking at the same thing. That's because we very much blend what you do in terms of sharing and doing the analysis. Insights is essentially an analytic workbench, but as important as the ability to analyze the data is being able to share those results. So Insights blends analysis and sharing so that you can make changes at any stage of your workflow without having to pay a huge penalty for making those changes. I can share out this page after making some, some updates to my analysis without having to recreate everything. So we're going to, as I say, work through this analysis throughout this demonstration this morning. For now, I'm going to hand it back to you, Scott. Sounds good. Okay. So next, let's dive right into our first topic, exploratory analysis. When you, work, when you look up the word explore, it has some of the characteristics and a description that apply directly to what exploratory analysis as a capability is all about. Exploratory analysis is all about looking at your data closely, testing, experimenting with it, discovering things within it, and examining it just for investigative purposes. How do you do that? Through visualization. And Insights has over 17 different charts that you can use to visualize your data with. Now, that's a lot to choose from, and it might be a little bit overwhelming to find the best option for your particular data set and what you're trying to show. But that's, again, why Insights has intelligent defaults. So let's say I choose two numeric fields to make a chart with. Insights will only present to me those charting options that make sense for those two numeric fields. In that case, it'd be a scatter plot and a key performance indicator card. Insights also has over 10 different mapping techniques you can choose from. Similar to charts, when you drag that data onto a map, Insights chooses the intelligent defaults for you, but in this case, of course, for the mapping technique. As always, you know, if you wanted to change that symbology, overwrite the default, you, of course, have control to do that. All right. Conceptually, exploratory analysis might make sense for visualizing the data, right? But what's some real-world examples? Here's, here's a few. So you could create a box plot showing outliers of water meters to identify dead water meters. Where are the leaks? Where are they broken? Where do we need to shut them off? A scatter plot of home assessment values to identify where houses need to be reassessed. Or maybe a tree map of 311 calls to show what are the most common types of government service request calls. All right, next, Linda. Could you show us what exploratory analysis looks like in Insights? Absolutely. So we've started here. This is the page that we were just looking at. What I'm going to do is turn to a second page, and we're going to start afresh with analysis, bringing in some data. So I could connect to my data, so my spatial data within my portal, so you can see all the data sets I had there. I might have that shared across groups or more widely for layers that are shared across my organization that a number of us work on. There's also access to the living atlas layers, as Scott just pointed out, but also census boundaries. So I'm actually going to bring in some state layers there. I also want to bring in some Excel and CSV files. So I'm just going to browse to some of those that I have. So I'm going to take my accidents and 
my miles traveled and add those in. And if I had data sat in a database, for example, SQL Server, Oracle, or SAP HANA, I could connect into those. I'm working on the enterprise version here. And then you can bring all of these data sets in together. You can see there's different types of data I'm bringing in. But they will all just be added into that page that I'm working on on my workbook. Spatial data is automatically mapped on a card. Non-spatial data, you'll see, is just visualized here in the data pane. So what I'm going to do is look at this accidents layer. So I'm going to click on this layer, and you'll see now that as we brought that in, we actually semantically modeled that data, which means that for you as the user, you can actually see what you have in that data immediately. So we're already exploring this data set. We can see that my state number is a numeric field. My state name is a categorical field. And I also have date down here. You can have control over here, so if I wanted my state number to be treated as a string, I could change that. So I'm going to explore this data set, and I'm going to drag across the date. And now you can see, just by dragging that field, that attribute, we can see those patterns over time. And I also get the information that I have a year's worth of data here. The date field is automatically broken down into the individual date components for you. This is just a convenience, so you don't have to go ahead and pull out that information, for example, as I want to do, to have a look at those patterns by month. That's automatically been done for me. Now I can immediately see that there are more of these road traffic accidents, these fatal traffic accidents that we're looking at, occurring during the summer months, less during the winter months. Let's change this to have a look at the pattern by day of the week. Now we can see that there are more of these accidents at weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, than we're seeing during the week. Now I could be looking at these two variables together. So let's go back in, add in the month. This will automatically update that, but you'll see any of these cards, we're actually just connecting to your data. This is allowing you to see the data in multiple different ways. So I want to change this so that we're able to see this, for example, in a heat chart. This is now aggregating that information by month, by day of the week, so that in this one card, I'm able to see that information that there's more in the summer months during the days of the weekend. I can also drag across information like in terms of the road classification. As I hover, you'll see that I'm given a choice of the type of chart that I want to create that's based on that kind of variable. Now I can see that most of these road accidents are happening on principal arterial roads. I could also drag across something like the light conditions, and you'll see I have the option to create a table of this. Oh, did the same one. Let me drag the light. Oh, I'm obsessed with that. Light conditions across to the table, and you'll see that that now allows us to see the number of accidents that have, have occurred in that light condition. So that's pivoting your data and giving you the sum by each of those different categories that you're interested in looking at. So I could also look at this data spatially, if I had a spatial component in this data set. At the moment, I have nothing in there. But I do have information in there that's clearly spatial. I have a state name, and down here I also have latitude and longitude. So I can make this data spatial by enabling the location. It's immediately picked up those fields, I want to add the spatial reference that I'm using within this data set. And now I'm going to enable the location on this data set. So I've done a lot of analysis in terms of exploring that data set already before making this spatial. Now I've added that spatial component. I've added the coordinates where each of these accidents have occurred. So now I can actually visualize that data on a map. And you'll see if I scroll down to here, we're actually looking at 34,000 different points here across the US, so 34,000 different accidents that we're looking at. So this map that we're looking at maybe isn't that useful. It's just showing us a lot of information on the map there. But I can change the type of map we're looking at. So I could change that to binning the data. So now we're aggregating that data on the fly. Let me zoom in a little bit. And now we can see that spatial pattern a little bit more clearly as to where more accidents are actually occurring within that data set. 
But that pattern that we're looking at in terms of counts maybe isn't telling us the whole story. So let's take it by state. So I'm going to drag across that spatial layer that I brought in. Remember, this was the census layer that I brought in. So that's just the state boundaries. I'm going to take those coordinates that I've done, but I'm actually just going to drag it from this layer. And you'll see, if I drag this across, I can aggregate those uh, number of accidents. So it may seem a little bit odd there that I'm dragging something that's aggregated, but we actually do this binning on the fly. So this data is still your points data, and there's a point at which you will actually see that that's points if you zoom into the data, because we re-aggregate at every zoom level. So I now have the point data set that's showing me those count of accidents by each one of the states. So now what I can do is I'm going to go into this Create Relationships, I'm going to take that spatial aggregation, and I'm going to look at the miles traveled I'm actually going to join these two data sets based on the state name. And now you'll see, let me close that out. You'll see, actually I'm going to look at the count of accidents on the map. So this is exactly where we were. But actually in this layer now, if I open up the legend, you'll see that I can change this to being a choropleth map. And I can actually divide that by the vehicle miles traveled per capita that will now take into account the number of miles that everybody's traveling within each of those states, therefore it, you know, if affecting how many accidents you would expect there to occur. And we can immediately pick out three states where there are more accidents, Florida, Texas, and California. So we've already got a good understanding of that data. Now I'm going to hand it back over to Scott. All right. Thank you, Linda. Okay, so that demonstration really showed us how insights can be used to perform exploratory analysis. We saw how outliers, patterns, and trends can be revealed, and how we can essentially play with each data set to force that data to reveal its secrets. Ultimately, so that we can uncover the right questions to ask. Next, we'd like to hear from you. What questions do you have? Okay. So I can see one question that's coming in about the the image you use out of the charts, so the icons. They were in three different colors. And somebody's asking there, Irene, I think it is, is asking why there were three different colors. So uh, that's actually to do with the defaults. So in, that, in each one of those icons that we were showing, you're, we're showing you whether it uses uh, qualitative, quantitative, or even temporal data. So whether it's, and to make it simpler, whether it's categories, whether it's strings you're working in, names of things, or whether it's actually numbers you're working with, or obviously whether it's time. So it's just giving you an idea of what type of data that kind of chart can be created from. Rick is asking, um, he says he sees some, uh, some buttons and some options that he doesn't have in his version of Insights. Um, so we just updated ArcGIS Online version of Insights last week. We're now on version 3.0, and that's also available in ArcGIS Enterprise. So you, you might, may need to uh, upgrade your, your version of Insights. Okay, so Henry's asking about what kind of data we can actually use and how we can register our data. So there's a number of different data sources that we can work with. So if you have spatial data, for example, if you're working with shape files or you're working with um, file geo databases, you can upload that data directly to the portal. So if you're working in ArcGIS Online or if you're working with ArcGIS Enterprise, you can bring those directly into the portal. Or if you have Excel data as a convenience, you can bring it directly into the add data. But of course, you may want to add that yourself to portal already. It's, that's an either or, that's an option. In terms of connecting into your databases, if your databases have spatial or non-spatial, you set up that connection directly from within Insights, and that will then allow you to bring that data in at the start of the analysis. I think maybe we have time for one more. What do you say? Yeah. Ali is asking, does Insights work with raster data? And the answer with that to that is no, not today. 
yeah, it's it's not that we we don't intend to do it one day. We started with vector data, and we will be working towards incorporating raster data in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, apologize if we didn't get to your all of the questions, but hopefully we have some time in the end to to get through yours. Next, we're going to move on to uh, spatial analysis and statistical analysis. So analysis is above and beyond just visualization, right? It involves running a process, a method, a procedure. And this next part is key. The analysis produces and stores a resulting data set that's available for you to reuse. So that derivative analysis data product, that can be used in insights to run more analysis on and iterate upon analysis on top of analysis on top of analysis. Or you can share or export that analysis data so it can be used in other external systems and that concept is pretty important so that actual analysis result that data that's something tangible of yours to keep to take and to reuse as you see fit so what specifically are some of the spatial analysis techniques available here's some of them spatial filter enriched data spatial aggregation calc density, find nearest, and create buffers or drive times. What about statistical analysis techniques? Here are some. Calculate percent change, calc ratio, calculate z-score, predict variable, create regression model, or view a link chart. So with more than a dozen spatial analysis and statistical analysis processes available, what are some real-world examples? So, using predict variable, you can forecast where 911 calls are likely to occur based on projected population and demographic data. Or using spatial filter and spatial aggregate, you can summarize and understand where the concentration and patterns are of social events and activities, say for defense and intelligence or policing. And lastly, you can use enriched data to add population to wildlife areas so that you can better understand the human impact on the environment. Next, Linda, would you mind showing us some examples of how spatial analysis and statistical analysis can be applied? Absolutely, this is the best bit. So let's switch to the next page and you'll see that I have a number of different data sets I've already brought in here. So the FARS data actually makes available a number of different ta tables that can actually be linked together. So that's where we're going to start here. So I'm going to create those relationships. I'm going to take those accidents that we've already been looking at. I'm going to take the vehicles. And the first thing it's going to do is link those two based on the first field that it finds in common. But you'll see if I click on that pencil there, I can now change that. So the unique identifier in each of these accidents is the ST case. So that's how I've now linked those two together. The persons actually links to the vehicles. So I'm going to drag that across to the vehicles. It's picked out the ST case, but because each one of those people may be associated, well, the vehicle may be associated with multiple people, then I need to do a compound join on that because it's not just based on the case. It's also going to be based on the vehicle number. So now I've done that compound join between those two. I also want to bring in another data set, which will become apparent as to why in a bit. I'm going to drag across helmet laws, which actually connects on the state name. So I'm going to take the state name there. And now I have those four tables that I've joined together. And that, as you'll see, is adding the result to my data pane that I can now work with that single file combining all of that information. So let's take those locations. I'm going to drag them across to a map. But what I want to do in this analysis is I want to just look at motorcycle accidents. So I'm going to scroll down here in my data pane towards where we see the body type and I'm going to filter that. If I filter on the data pane, it's going to filter all of the downstream analysis that's involved. I could actually filter anywhere on any of the individual cards and that's going to affect just that card rather than all of the downstream analysis. But here I want to look at the whole analysis to be filtered to motorcycles, if I've spelt that right, nope, there we go, and now I can select all of those, a little tip here, if you use shift select rather than 
clicking each individual button it will allow you to do that multiple select there so now you'll see that map will update so that I'm looking at just those accidents where a motorcycle was actually involved so now I'm going to scroll down to the bottom of that. Do you remember the table I added in on helmet laws? This is where we're going to use it. So I'm going to take the state, the law coverage, and I'm going to create a table of that. So now I've got the two categories. We can see whether the law requires you, in terms of universal law, everyone must wear a crash helmet, partial law, people of certain ages must wear a crash helmet, and there are some states where there's no law at all. If I drag that field in front of the state, you'll see now very clearly we can divide that out to the, there's no law, partial law, universal law. And also in terms of the interactivity, if I select on Illinois, it's going to pull out all of those accidents that occurred at Illinois. Whereas if I select on no law, it's going to select all three of those states where there's no law requiring that you must wear a crash helmet when you ride a motorcycle. So now we can select out all those areas where there's a partial law and those states where there is a law that everyone who wears a, rides a motorcycle must wear a crash helmet. So I'm also going to enable on this table here, you see the little button there that says enable cross filters. So I'm going to click that on and we're going to see how that affects the next piece of analysis we're going to do. So let's have a look at the restraints that are used. So obviously in the case of crash helmets, Sorry, in the case of motorcycles, we're talking about crash helmets. Um, I'm also going to scroll up and see whether these accidents tend to occur near junctions, for example. So I'm looking at relationship between two variables. So I'm going to use a chord diagram to look at that pattern. So let's explore whether no helmets, how that does in terms of the junctions. So we see that actually a lot of these are occurring when there's not a junction, a fair few at intersections, but mostly where there's no junction. And also, let's jump back here to this table. If you remember, if I click off where there's helmet, keep an eye on the total here, you'll see that there's over 5,000 accidents that occurred with motorcycles. If I click on no helmet, you see that is using that cross-filtering to now show you that there's 2,000 accidents where in fact the motorcyclist involved was not wearing a crash helmet. Of course, as you'd expect, those states where they don't have to wear helmets have the highest numbers. But very interestingly, we can scroll down here and we'll actually see a number of motorcyclists in states where they should, by law, be wearing helmets, were in fact not wearing helmets at all. So what else can we do in terms of this? So we're looking at these two variables here. So we're looking at restraints and we're looking at whether they're looking at junctions. We can actually expand this and we can change the visualization type that we use at any stage. We've already seen that. I'm going to change that to a link chart. That's now actually doing analysis behind the scenes. It's, ag it's um, doing a calculation that sizes the nodes that determines how many connections there are, in this case between the location, whether it's relatively close to a junction or not, and whether they were wearing a helmet. Now in terms of the chord diagram, we can only look at two relationships. Using a link chart, I can look at multiple different relationships. So I'm just going to pop out that legend there, and now I'm going to look at the cause of the accident. You'll see I'm going to drag that variable across. You see how the node highlights. I can then drop that on there, and now you see I can look at multiple different relationships within that same data set to understand those links involved between all of those variables. So there's another piece of information that I have within this table that I actually have the zip codes of where the drivers live that were involved in all of these accidents. So I'm going to enable the location on this. I'm going to select geography rather than coordinates because what I want to do is join that information on the zip code, so the zip code value onto the US zip code. Again, these are the boundary data sets I've used. So this is now adding the zip code sh uh, shape field to that data set. Now this is interesting. Remember, we already have the coordinates, so I already have a spatial field. Now I have a second spatial field on that data set. What I can do is I can take the zip code where the drivers come from, the coordinates where the accident actually occurred, 
I'm going to drag those two shape fields across to a map and this is now going to create a link map. Very similar to what we're seeing here in the link chart, it's showing the connections between those locations and what we can do because we know that there is actually some kind of flow involved and actually I'm going to expand out this so you can see this a little more clearly. I'm going to expand out the legend and we have complete control all of this information here. So clicking on the node you'll see I can change the color of the node so I'm going to make that a little bit brighter so you can see that. I could also click on something like the links and then we can start to explore relationships in terms of the links, so whether it occurred in a rural or urban location. But importantly here, we're actually talking about something that does have directionality because they live at their zip codes, the accident occurred where we have those XY coordinates. So I'm going to add in directional and now you see we have a flow map. We can also pull out that information, I'm going to look pull out that information on the links so now we can select out all of those accidents that happen in rural locations or urban locations or actually a little bit more interestingly let's change this so that we're looking at the cause of the accident so now we're going to look at that legend and we're going to see for example where a police pursuit was involved now remember the size of the nodes here are the number of people who lived at that zip code who were involved in a fatal accident. The line is then showing you where they traveled to before the fatal accident actually occurred. But we can explore that data in an interesting way, both spatially, that we're not seeing when we're looking at that data in a non-spatial way. So you'll see combining spatial analysis and standard analysis, we can pull out multiple pieces of information. So what about looking at changes over time? So far we've been looking at one year's worth of data. Now I'm going to look at this data between two different years. So I'm going to take the US counties. So we can zoom into this again. Boundary data that I use that's made available to us. I'm also going to take the number of accidents in 2015. And you'll see if I drag that across, I can aggregate up the total number of accidents that occurred in 2015. Again, I'm going to repeat that analysis, and this time I'm going to drag across the number of accidents that occurred in 2016. So I've aggregated both of those count of accidents into the same layer, and you'll see that I have that count of accidents, and now I can calculate the difference between those two years. So I'm going to go into what's changed, calculate that percentage difference, between the number of accidents in 2015, the number in 2016. Let's give my output field a new name. Table pops open to show you that it's done that calculation. You see it's added that field that I selected and now it's calculated down here the percentage difference between those two years of data. Because this is a percentage, it's going to by default map this as a choropleth. So if you have data that you know is already a percentage, a rate, or a ratio, you can select that at any stage to make your map by default a choropleth. So I want to go in and change how we've symbolized this a little bit. First thing I want to do is have six categories. I also, because I'm showing the percentage difference, I want to make sure that this is a bivariate color scheme, so we're seeing those areas that are above and below. So let's change it to... Whoops, picked the wrong one there. A red green one. So we can clearly pick out the difference. There we go. Uh, let's get rid of the outline thickness so we can clearly see those color changes. And now we can see those areas that have above and below a percentage difference between 2015 and 2016. We could also do some kind of prediction. Let's let's have a look at a number of the variables to see if it's worth predicting from. So we could look at the number of accidents, let's say the population and the square miles. I'm going to drag those across. It's going to create a scatter plot matrix which is going to show us those relationships. Now we can see that here the population has a good relationship. The others don't at all. So let's just drag out that chart that's showing us the population is a pretty good predictor. 
we can see that relationship there and we could then of course go ahead and do some kind of prediction so I could go in and let's have a look under how things are related create a regression model so I'm going to use try and predict create a model sorry from 2015 with the population let's run that model we'll see we've got a point R eight four R squared our Durban Watson test is pretty good we can see our standardized residuals obviously you would want to use a lot more variables than that but this is just to give us an idea of how we can do that and then if we had our 2016 data let's say we could then easily predict to those locations so I could drag across my regression model and you'll see that now I'm able to map those different variables so I could change that to my 2016 population and that will now give me the estimate that it's predicted to any of those locations so it's a pretty simple process now to calculate your OLS model and then do that prediction imagine though now I want to share out these results I want to allow people to actually explore this percent difference that we were showing up here so I might want to show something like um, the distribution of that data that they have within that or I might want to be showing um, that percentage difference by each one of those counties so we could have a look at the distribution of accidents as a box plot we can see that by each one of the states so this is actually doing some statistical analysis for you because it's now allowing you to example pull out all of those outliers within your data and you'll see all of those are being updated as well so you can select out those areas so imagine I want to allow other people to actually have a look through this by state what I'm going to do is actually add in a widget of a predefined filter here I'm going to scroll down to that data set that we're looking at so I'm going to find my spatial aggregation and I'm going to add it by state to allow people to select through each one of those states and I'm going to change how this is visualized a bit because I want to allow them to just select one state at a time you see how that quickly updated to just showing one state see at the moment it's showing Alaska which we don't see on the map and now we could take something like the counties and that percentage difference put that into a bar chart which I didn't do earlier because it would have just showed too many bars it wouldn't have been very readable but now we're exploring it by state now you can actually step through all of those spatially you can see where it's had got changes and you can also quantify that by looking at the different charts so that's exploring the data in a number of different ways I'll hand it back to you Scott beautiful beautiful thank you Linda okay so Linda showed us how spatial empowers us with a completely unique set of analysis capabilities above and beyond non-spatial, right? And how statistics, that allows us to quantify data, predict, forecast what's likely to happen. And remember, when you perform real analysis, it creates a derivative data set that's available for you to keep, reuse in other places as you want. Next, we want to hear from you. So what questions do you have about spatial and statistical analysis. So Ari here is working about asking about the ability to calculate dates. For example, as a construction project is moving along at a rate over the last month, week, then when will the construction project be completed? So I'm actually thinking and I'm I'm thinking on the fly here that something like the KPI card might be something that would be able to do that because you could set the date the time at which you would want something to be completed by the number of days in which you would assume that that uh, piece of work construction would take and then when it is going beyond that then the KPI card will update to say that you have taken more days than you would expect it to take right and there is the ability to calculate new fields absolutely yeah so you can always you're right you can always add new fields and then that will update based on the other fields yeah yep. that's right see here 
Got some questions about link analysis. Okay, so the link analysis is interesting, but I'm not sure how it can apply to me. Yeah, link analysis is something that's, it's actually, we used to use it a long time ago in, in social geography, sorry, in, uh, yeah, in social geography, and then it became something that very much was involved in criminology. So it's actually very useful in terms of anything. What it's doing is helping you find the most important thing. Now, the most important thing could be the the computer that you don't want to go down. It could be water meters that are uh, going to cost a lot to fix. Uh, it could be a bridge. It could be anything, or it could be something a little bit more ephemeral, like a phone call, who's the most important person. There's lots of different things in which we would want to see connections between different things. So it has a wide use. It does take a little bit of time to understand what it's actually telling you, but it's very rich in terms of the information that it gives you. Okay, maybe we have time for one more here. Um, Henry's asking, uh, is it possible to export graphics into a presentation like PowerNote, PowerPoint, or Keynote, um, and allowing some type of basic interactivity? Uh, yes, um, you can do a couple things. We'll, we're going to review the sharing section next. Um, but you can uh, definitely take a shared page, take the iframe, embed it into uh, a web page, a story map, or print and create, say, uh, a, a JPEG or a uh, PDF. All right, with that, I think for the sake of time, and apologies if we didn't get to your question, we should be moving on. Um, and our next topic is sharing your analysis. So... As analysts, you know, we spend a ton of time, right, acquiring data, understanding it, formatting it, and finally analyzing it so we can get answers and uncover information. And once we reveal that information, we really want to communicate that so that those insightful discoveries we made, that can be used, that information can be leveraged, that great analysis, that work. We don't just want to leave it sitting on our desktop. And Insights allows you to share pages so that Anyone can view your shared pages anonymously. Or you can control access to that shared page by requiring users to log in with an ArcGIS username and password. Either uh, is, is possible, but the choice is up to you. Insights also enables you to collaborate with other analysts. Beyond, um, behind the scenes, as you work, Insights automatically creates a model for you. And that model can then be shared with other analysts so they can rerun your analysis. Or at least they can see your model to understand your methodology and give your results a little bit more credibility. Let's look at this in a tiny more detail. So again, as an analyst, once you complete your work, you want to share that, share that information product. This could be people within your organization, maybe the public but they get to interact with that analysis result, those visualizations. They can interact with those. You may, ask me, you may also need to collaborate with other analysts. And by sharing the model, you're giving that analyst a cookbook or a recipe for recreating what you've done with their own data. And that, docu that, that, that model basically serves as a document for everything you've done. So there are a couple main scenarios where you might want to share a model. Uh, one is for repeating analysis across different regions or geographies. So say you did an analysis process for one territory. Sure, that same process should be repeatable across different territories. Another is for periodic or reoccurring analysis. Say you have a report. you got to do this report once a year, but with new data. An insights model would be perfect for that. You know, you shouldn't have to struggle with remembering what the exact steps you did last year were. Take that model from last year and plug in your new data set. And this altogether is how Insights really maximizes the great work that you do as an analyst. Okay, and then, you know, finally, when you share your, your, your finished product, right, it, it needs to appear refined, finished, presentable. And you want your information product to appear authoritative, you know, representative of your organization and maybe have that brand recognition. You want your analysis to appear credible with reference sites, reference material, and people that maybe contributed. And finally, you don't want your results to be misinterpreted. 
You need to guide the viewer through a contextual understanding. Tell them a story and a narrative. What's the meaning of your analysis? And this is all critical to the success of and how people interpret your insights shared pages. All this is possible. Insights lets you do this so that you can, again, provide that context to ensure that everything is interpreted correctly. So to really understand this, maybe an example would be best. Uh, Linda, can you, can you show us what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with, in terms of us, so this is the analysis. We know that we've done all of this analysis live. Let me start at the very beginning where we started with exploring that data on that first page. You'll see what we've been working on here is actually the page view. So I'm actually going to go across one bit here to the analysis view. If I click on that, now you're seeing the model that Scott's just been talking about. So everything that we're, I've done has been recorded and we can actually see exactly what we did as part of that analysis. So some of the things like creating that bar chart, remember we actually dragged across the road classification and then it um, pivoted that data, created the bar chart of each of the different road classification types were in that for us to pick out that the principal arterial roads had the most accidents on them. Well that actually requires some kind of aggregation by road classification type. It's the count for each of those road classes. So in the model, although I was completely unaware as the analyst, in the model we're actually showing that some kind of aggregation has been done to that data so you have that full transparency into what's going on in terms of your data. Same in terms of the heat chart. We're aggregating those into pieces of information by days of the week, months of the year. Again, that's requiring some kind of aggregation of that data. So I've seen there's been a couple of questions coming in in terms of how can you update your data? How can you rerun that analysis? So one way you could do it if you just need to rerun the data and you're actually connected in, for example, you're connected to a database or even a feature layer, we're actually connected live to that data. So you'll see here we have that refresh button. And you can actually select that and that will run. And you can shown by the blue line that will rerun all of that downstream analysis, updating it if any of that original data has actually changed. If in the example here we don't see that refresh button, that's because this is Excel data. If you remember, I brought in an Excel file. So we actually copied across that Excel file. So what I can do if, is I've, if I've updated my own Excel file is I can just update that, bring in the new file, and again, all of that downstream analysis will be rerun automatically by the update of that data. So that's if you want to just update the analysis in this workbook here. But what if I want to share out that model? I want to rerun that analysis, as Scott was saying, with another data set, another time, in a year's time, or I just need to run a report every month. I can share that model back out, I can share that to my portal, I can decide whether I want to just share it to myself, share it more widely to my organization. I could do exactly the same in terms of the page. So I want to share out those results. So I can share that page of results, or I can also share something as a theme. So this is a new feature down here. So let me jump back to that very first page that we were looking at. Remember I said we were starting at the end and we were going to work our way back to it. So this is actually a page I've set up. I've added in a widget here, so you'll see a text and media widget, widget in which I was able to bring in an icon. You can actually add in videos and things. And I've also added in my, my data source. So there's a couple of people asking that here where I got the data from. So you'll see this from, is from the National Highway Transport Safety Association. So if you want to recreate the analysis, you can, of course, go and download that data and redo it. And hopefully I've met with your strict conditions there, Scott. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see I have all of those features there. And I can then share out that page. And I can also, as I was saying, share that as a theme. So I've made a few changes here. And you'll see that I can do that here in terms of the card settings. I can also do it down here on the page settings. So I can decide whether I want a border, what color I want the background to be. So in this case, I've just kind of minimized everything to bring the information I wanted to share a little bit more to the front and allowing people to step through all of that. So I actually shared out a theme that means I could also do that to any of my other pages. 
It will repeat exactly how this is visualized in terms of the coloring. I can choose whether I want to add in this banner. And it doesn't matter on other pages if I have a different type of charts, different numbers of charts and maps. It's just the coloring that you've decided for that type of card. So let me show you how you'd access all of that information once you've shared it out. You'll see, do you remember when I added in the data at the start, there was the data. There's also these two additional tabs, models. So you see these are models I've already created. I could bring those in. And also themes, you'll see that this is the theme that I've shared out. So I could repeat the way in which I've decided to visualize that data there. So that's what I have in terms of the, the sharing, I think. Oh, one, sorry, one last thing I should say, very importantly. The result layers that we've created, we can, of course, share those out as well. So you can share the data. So it's not just the results, it's also the analysis as you do it, as you go through. So back to you, Scott. Thank you. All right, beautiful. Thank you, Linda. So we saw how Insights allows you to share your interactive analysis results with viewers, either anonymous viewers or could require a login. And we saw how models can be shared with other analysts for collaboration and how our shared information products can now include context so a story or narrative can be included. Next, let's hear from you. Um, what type of questions do you have about sharing your analysis? So somebody's actually saying, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, that they're seeing some buttons and some options that they don't have in the version of Insights that they, they've been working on. You're absolutely right. So this is the most recent version of Insights. We've only just um, actually released that about a week ago. So you should see a lot of these functions in the online version. As I say, we've just released the enterprise version as well. So some of the things like the widgets that you saw me talking about, adding in the predefined filter, adding in the text widget. You won't have that if you have the last version, and this is all part of something we've concentrated on. We also expanded a few things in terms of the link analysis. So you'll see a lot more functionality in the link analysis tabs that you have, the way that you can actually visualize the link charts, the way you can control the way in which you have all the different uh, colors and options in both the link charts and the link maps. So that's all new. So yeah, this is the latest version that you're seeing and a few new interesting things that hopefully you'll find useful to work with. Yep. We also have another question about printing reports. And again, so within the uh, page, you do have the option to print. It uses your web browser print function. And you can even export it from there as a PDF or uh, image. So here's a question coming in from you, Scott, from Larry. Do viewers of reports need an Insights license or an ArcGIS Online license? Um, they Okay, so great question. You do not need to have an Insights license to view shared analysis reports. You, as the analyst, control if you want to make that available to anybody, the public. And when you share that page, they don't need to log in. If you want to not enable anonymous access, maybe you just want to share it with people within your organization, that's when you would share it with a group. And people within that group need to log in with their ArcGIS identity to see that shared report. So you as the analyst have complete control over that. You don't have to have an Insights license if you uh, share it publicly. OK, um, with that, I think we'll uh, start to wrap it up for today. We covered quite a bit, and if we look back, what did we do? Well, remember, we first got started by looking at exploratory analysis, and then we dove deep in st into statistical and spatial analysis. And then finally, we talked about sharing your analysis results. Before we go, uh, I'd like to just point you to a few resources. We have a lot of training courses and material out there, uh, including instructor-led, self-guided, and then other uh, resources. Check out our help documentation. There's some tutorials within there. We'd really appreciate it uh, if we got your, your feedback. There, you should see a, a Take Survey button, and we'd like to hear what you have to say. We hope you'd, you enjoyed today's seminar. On behalf of Esri, Linda, myself, uh, thank you for watching. Take care. Mm -hmm.